uh, Marilyn Jan. I'm on the uh, Meowbo Creek Reserve in uh, Newfoundland, Con River, better known as Con River, uh, in in Newfoundland. Yeah, Saint Anne School. It's Saint Anne. Saint Anne has been known as the patron saint of the Mi'kmaq people. All right, all right, okay. Well, since since they became Christians anyway, yeah. <laughs> assimilated as you said. I don't think they knew who she was before yeah. that. Yeah. My job here is a student assistant to the math teacher for junior high. So we do, I'm, I'm in the classroom with the math teacher for any kid that need help with in their math in grades 7, 8, and 9. No, it's a SIT curriculum by the province, same curriculum that other schools use within the province. So I'm in the classroom from 8.30 or 9 o'clock when the kids come in. Till three, and then from three to four thirty, I do tutoring. Uh, years ago, uh, when I was trying to decide uh, what my next job in life was going to be after politics, was like, uh, do I do I go back to school? Do I go to university? Do I go looking for a job? And uh, it was at a time when my brother was trying to get a business off the ground, and uh, he just got frustrated with with. Uh, all the the roadblocks that I think that he was in getting the permits mm -hmm. and and things like that, and he just gave up on it. And so I says, hmm, maybe I'll give it a try. And so I did, and here I am, twenty eight years later, still running a a gas bar and a restaurant. And it's seasonal, wow. but it's twenty eight yeah. years, and we employ seven or eight people a year. So and it's the same, pretty much the same people has been with me for the last twenty eight years. Oh, so nice. we've had a good staff. Well, the people, first of all, uh, but one of the things is that we're having, having control of your own education gives you an opportunity to develop programs uh, within the system in addition to what's required within the curriculum. The other thing I think that, they're try that they try to do here is within the curriculum that's there, like the social studies and the the uh, language or the literature or the whether you're writing a history hissy an essay or whether you're getting kids to write a story you're trying to encourage them to put as much Aboriginal content into it as they can the art program uh, the art teacher tries to encourage as much Aboriginal content into the artwork as possible um, the music program mm -hmm. in past years uh, have had a lot of Aboriginal uh, music and song to it. I know when my daughter was in the music here, uh, a lot of her music was uh, and included the language. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the kids that was their, their first exposure to the language years ago was through the music program. Mm -hmm. So I, I think we need a lot more of that. And mm -hmm. we need... Because those are the programs that you really can include the Aboriginal content is within, within the arts program and within the music program. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're sticking to regular curriculum, there's only so much that you can add to the current social studies. You can add a lot more because it teaches you about the different peoples within your own province. Mm -hmm. And way back when I was growing up, there was so little of it in the textbooks as so negative. Mm -hmm. That was, that was, that's one of the things that is starting to change as we go. And even just this morning, sitting down with the kids, uh, going through their little dictionaries and trying to write the uh, sentences uh, using the Mi'kmaq language is encouraging. Um, hate to be negative, but we're a long way from kids speaking the language. Mm -hmm. Uh, because in the day, you know, my my grandfather spoke the language fluently. He grew up with the language. That was his first language. But then when he became an adult, during his adult years, tuberculosis was very rampant around here. And the Aboriginal women were the caretakers. And because they were the caretakers and because... Tuberculosis was such a contagious disease. A lot of them developed tuberculosis and died from it. So back in, in my grandfather's day, when he became a young adult, 
there was a shortage of Aboriginal women. And as a result, mm. they intermarried. There was a lot of non-Native women mm -hmm. brought into the community. Mm -hmm. uh, the non-Native women could not speak the language. So children being raised at home by non-Native mothers didn't learn the language because the father who spoke the language lived off the country. They were trappers, mm -hmm. they were hunters, uh, they were fishers. They weren't the ones that was at home every day teaching the, the skills and teaching the language. So a lot of the skills and knowledge and language disappeared during my mother's time. She grew up hearing the language and being able to understand some of the language, but it was never passed on to us. And the other problem was it, at that same time, the churches intervened in the political structure mm -hmm. of the community and forbid the use of the language. My mom as a kid was punished for speaking the language. And, and as a result, she forgot a lot of it. She forgot an awful lot of it. She knew when she was little, but she forgot a lot of it. Mm -hmm. So trying to bring back a language that's been dead for 70 plus years or 80 years, even even in my mom's day, who would have been in her 90s now, it, it was uh, it was restricted. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, you've got 80, 90 years of, of deterioration of the language trying to mm -hmm. bring it back. There's a big effort here to do it, and you have to start with the little children mm -hmm. because they're sponges. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They learn a lot faster than most of us. And... Uh, and we finally got a Mi'kmaq speaking teacher here. And a lot of the kids, especially the younger kids, are more engaging in the language. As, as the kids get older and they become teenagers, they're, they're too cool for that. And they don't want to. No, that's the mm -hmm. truth. They just don't want mm -hmm. And their attitude is, what am I going to do with that? Mm -hmm. Who am I going to speak to? And the other problem is that the little kids are learning it, which is great in the school system. But... When they go home, that's the end of it. Once they go through the doors here, uh, very few of the parents are encouraging it at home. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I don't know, unless you have an immersion, a total immersion mm -hmm. course, mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure that the language, other than being aware of the language, knowing some of the language, some of the songs, some of the words, maybe some of the prayers mm -hmm. that go with it. I'm not sure you're going to find fluent speaking kids mm -hmm. unless they become fully immersed in it. And I think that's had to be a personal decision because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I don't think that's something that you can force kids to do, mm -hmm. especially in this day and age with so much technology. You know, they don't, they don't see it as important. Mm -hmm. you know, people like me see it as important. I wish that I had the opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I wish my mom had never lost it, or my dad. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but it's what happened. So with, yeah, because your, your, your language, part of your language comes your songs, mm -hmm. your prayers. Uh, but then, like I say, as... As families become mixed, there's more and more assimilation. And when I went to school, you could look at the faces in the classroom and knew that these were Aboriginal kids. Mm -hmm. And I can walk through the classrooms now, and I cannot tell you unless I... I do, because I know, but to look at the kids, mm -hmm. I can't tell if these mm -hmm. kids are Aboriginal, if you took them out of here and sat them in a classroom in St. John's, I would not, or you would not be able to walk into the classroom and say those are Aboriginal mm -hmm. kids. Mm -hmm. You can't tell by looking at them anymore mm -hmm. because they don't have the Aboriginal features. They don't mm -hmm. have the strong Aboriginal genetics that, mm -hmm. that we had because we had both parents were Aboriginal mm -hmm. because of the intermixing and intermarriage. Mm -hmm. Now you have, you know, a kid that doesn't have those features. Yeah. And a lot of kids, because they don't have those features, they feel 
uh, a little intimidated by it but because they feel they're not Aboriginal. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. a lot of them don't say it. Mm-hmm. But then when you get into one side, oh, well, because I don't look Aboriginal, I can get away with not telling anyone I'm Aboriginal. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so there is a lot of assimilation, even this. And as we become more open here, we've got, we were isolated back in my day. Mm-hmm. Uh, the only access was by, by boat or by water. So as you get paved highways and people's got jobs and vehicles and they do mm-hmm. a lot more traveling, you're getting a lot more assimilation. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. It's a, as, as, as assimilation becomes bigger and bigger, the job of retaining the culture and, and keeping the culture and keeping the language alive becomes more and more difficult. It becomes a bigger job for little communities like, like us who have all that access. I think the more isolated you are, the, the better opportunity you have of keeping your culture alive and keeping your language alive. I would, I would like to see a lot more Aboriginal activity within the school, especially using the art room, uh, mm-hmm. not just for doing artwork of uh, cities or, or some other, um, your art based on somebody else's culture, somebody mm-hmm. else's, uh, uh, I guess, stories or whatever. I would like to see within that art room, I would like to see somebody see somebody reteaching how to do, say, the spruce root baskets. Spruce root baskets was one of yeah. the very unique things that used to be done around here. Yeah. And, and it's nearly lost. There's only a handful of people that still know how to do it. Now's your time to mm-hmm. bring that back, bring it to the kids. Sure, you know, I mean, if you've got, uh, if you've got, say, 80 or 100 kids here, if you get 10 of them that retain it and remember it, even if you get 10%, that 10% is better than nothing. Um, teach, teach your spruce root baskets, teach your moose hair tufting that used to be there, mm-hmm. done here long before my mother's time or her grandmother's time, because by then beads were introduced, but they used to do the tufting on the clothes. Mm-hmm. And there is still a couple of people left because I reintroduced it way back in the seventies. That was one of the, one of the arts, one of the crafts skills that I reintroduced back into the community through the uh, crafts program, within the community crafts program, and was the moose hair tufting. And a handful of people did learn it, and some people were really, really good at it. And this, there's still one or two that know how to do it. Grab that person. Mm-hmm. Get them to teach it within the school system. Um, birch bark baskets. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, we, I, I don't ever remember this community here working with quills, uh, porcupine quills, mm-hmm. because there were no porcupine here on the island. But it's, it's something that our Aboriginal people do know how to do, and, it, it's, and there's nothing wrong with bringing it from the other Mi'kmaq people who know how to mm-hmm. do it. Um, my mom, as a kid, used to go with her grandmother to collect wood for making baskets. Now, we didn't use the black ash because we didn't have it here. They used the, um, my mom called it white maple. And uh, mm. and she described how it was used. And there's nobody here that know how to do that anymore. But the art of making baskets is the same, whether you use uh, white maple or whether you use black ash. Teach the kids how to make a traditional basket within the art room. Um, teach the fine arts, you know, bring in an artist to teach the skill of using your paint and your waters and colors and, 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 uh, base your, base your teachings on, uh, oral history or stories or the mythology or whatever, you know, the, Mm -hmm. the, the old, um, Mm -hmm. old stories or old, that was around years ago, and uh, those kinds of things. Um, 
part of the program, I remember years ago, I did a program with the Newfoundland Museum. And one of the things we tried to do was capture old traditional crafts or art or knowledge that was so quickly disappearing. And one of the things we did, we did bark tanning. How to tan hides using the bark from the root of the tree. We did how to make uh, shanks, what they call shanks, which was a long, long booth made from the, uh, the leg of the caribou. Mm. And there was, there was what they called the shanks. There was two ways of making it. One of them was with the hair on the outside, which was used to walking on the ice and the slippery areas. And the other one was one that was where they took all the hair off it and bark tanned it and it was worn in, inside. We did, uh, we did a, a, a slideshow on how to make a caribou hide canoe. We took a couple of elders with us and we flew back in the country to a hunting lodge and, they, and we filmed it and we uh, did a slideshow right from the beginning to taking the caribou, to cleaning the caribou, to cleaning the hide and putting it together to making the canoe. And, and those are skills nobody know how to do anymore. My dad talked about using a caribou hide canoe, you know, so cool. and, but, but you need resources to do that. Mm -hmm. You need money to do that, which the school has resources, but it's limited. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to bring in people who still know how mm -hmm. to do that to teach. And that costs money. These people aren't going to come here for nothing. Mm -hmm. So you still need a lot more resources. Yeah, we're, 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 it's great that we have the resources that we got. But to do all these other wonderful things, you need a lot more than we have here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think the community like, has got to get behind it. Uh, I remember years ago, first, when I introduced the idea of having a powwow here around the council chambers, because I was on council at the time, mm -hmm. and... Uh, and everybody was, oh, no, no, you know, people's not going to go for that. Nobody's not going to uh, get involved in that. And you're never going to see a, a powwow here. And I said, oh, you don't know unless you try. Somebody's got to start. And it was left at that for a few years. And then finally it did take off. And somebody did finally do something about it. And now they've got one of the bigger it's powwows in, in Atlantic Canada. And it's beautiful. It's been successful. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, so you just gotta somebody's just gotta do it, yeah. right? And and that's like here, somebody's gotta do it. It's not gonna no good to talk about it if you don't do it. Those, those are the things you have to do. And you have to start with getting the children interested in doing those kinds of things. We need to have the kids like for example, yeah, it's great to have the kids playing volleyball and basketball and everything else, but why aren't we teaching kids how to play Waltus? Waltus is an Aboriginal Mi'kmaq game. How come we don't have Waltus bowls and how come we don't have, as part of the learning process here, kids learning how to play Waltus and set up a little competition? I mean, you can even have Atlantic competition among other Mi'kmaq reserves throughout Atlantic Canada. You know, it's, a, it's, it's fun, it's a game. Kids like games. But you've got to do it on a regular basis. It's no good to say, introduce it to them, and they never see it again. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. so, so those are the things I would like to see. I would like to see the kids, the Walters becoming a, a big thing with mm -hmm. the kids, learning how to do it, taking it home, and eventually teaching it to their children. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And until that happens, it's not, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's not going to develop into something bigger. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. uh, but you've got to get the kids excited and interested in it. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't know. If there's a last uh, message, but I know it's some of the things I look at as encouraging, very encouraging, and some more things are very discouraging because it's not enough of it being mm -hmm. done. Mm -hmm. Like you know, it, I know our 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 government keeps talking about culture and everything else, but outside of the school, I see very little of it. I see very little of it. And even when I look at this new school, the school is so new and so beautiful, We, I think there could have been a more cultural appearance to it. Mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. other than coming into the foyer and seeing seeing uh, the artwork on the floor, you know, you can walk around the school and it looks like every other school with the exceptions of posters and things mm -hmm. that the teachers have put up themselves. Yes. And I think with governments today, they want to put in schools and they want to push mm -hmm. them and build them so fast and that, that they, they don't give any real thought to how can we reflect the culture of the community. And, and one thing as you come in doesn't say it all, you know. As, and uh, that would be nice, and I would I would just like to see a lot, yeah. a lot more. The mini mini powwow at the school is wonderful, because it gets the kids excited, and and kids get especially little kids get very excited about different things, mm -hmm. and um, but being uh, sometimes I I think um, there's too much emphasis on oh we can't let the little kids. Um, use this or use that because they might burn themselves, they might cut themselves, they might, you know, that wasn't a part of our culture, no. right? Our culture taught kids when they were very, very young. And you, know, you burn your finger, you cut your finger, you bruise your finger, whatever, or your toes or your hands, or it heals. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not life or death. Mm -hmm. It's not something that you're going to die from. Mm -hmm. And it's it comes with learning things. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, and kids did that and was involved in learning at a very young age within our culture. You know, mm -hmm. and we have we've all of a sudden we've adopted that safety thing because kids aren't safe, and and we've gone overboard with that. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so I think we, you need to get back to. And I know back in the day when my son was very young, one of the things that the school had was a uh, was a wilderness camp that they had and he was I don't know maybe grade six grade five grade six when they took a bunch of kids with some elders and they took them mm -hmm. into the bush and and they gave them that experience kids today kids doesn't very few of the kids go rabbit catching or moose hunting or they're they're more interested in the the video games than they are in so how you know Figure out how do you get those kids interested in in learning things in the bush as learning things on YouTube, mm -hmm. right? You going to learn how to moose hunt on YouTube? Mm. You know, yeah, it's lovely to watch the YouTube videos, but you know, take them and mm -hmm. take them out in the bush. You take what's normally taught in the schools and you improvise using the materials and skills to to that that teaching. One of the big things I would like to see in the community outside of the school would be a cultural summer camp. Mm. I would love to see a cultural summer camp where the kids would go in and we've got all kinds of facilities here that's not being utilized in the summertime. The hunting lodges, they got beautiful facilities in hunting. Take the kids in, teach them how to build a wigwam, teach them how to weave a, a spruce root basket, teach them how to set a rabbit snare, teach them some of the different things that, mm -hmm. skills that everyone as a kid learned when I was growing up, you know, and teach them to respect, the respect for the earth. Kids today take a wrapper and throw it over their shoulders, you know. And I, I suppose they're learning from the parents because the, t the parents take a Tim's cup and chuck it in the ditch. So that's that's not when when we went upriver with my dad uh, salmon fishing. And my dad go salmon fishing, catch salmon, and we'd bottle it up for the winter and put it in the cellar. If we took something in, we brought it back out. My dad used to always say, "It's lighter to bring back out." than it was to carry in. Why wouldn't you bring it back up with you? Mm. Why would you throw it in the, in the woods or in the river? You wouldn't do that. Kids today they don't hesitate to do it because they haven't been taught. And th those are the kinds of things that if you had a month long summer camp that teach the kids how to properly use a canoe. You know, a lot of the kids should learn how to how to how to use the waterways and how to use the trails and what to look for and plants and there's a lot of stuff that they can learn in a, in a month in a bush. Mm 